Hi, I'm Kat Corbett at KROC, and I welcome to uh, the Red Bull Sound Space. This is the area we're in with Ben Gibbard from Death Cab for Cutie. I feel like we should have a fake applause. Kind of crazy. I'll applaud for myself. That is very. Why not? It's great to see you again, and uh, you just released Kintsugi. Congratulations. This morning, yes, thank you. I looked up the definition. I cheated and I went, because I was like, what the heck does Kintsugi mean? Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a beautiful description of what the word means having to do with pottery. And I can make the leap in my mind as to how you <clears throat> portrayed it in your songwriting. But what does it mean to you? What, what does Kintsugi mean to you? How does it apply to the record? Well, uh, for those who don't know, it's a Japanese uh, technique of repairing broken ceramics. But, you know, instead of just making it look like it did before it was broken, they use gold or some precious metal within the adhesive that makes the cracks kind of visible. Um, so it highlights the... the highlights the yeah. breakages, yes. Yeah, yeah. And for me, I, you know, Nick, our bass player, kind of brought it to my attention, and I really liked the term as it relates to just being a songwriter. I feel like what I've been trying to do all these years is kind of a... Metaphor metaphorical version of that, which is, you know, to try to, f you know, f you know, kind of put together things that are broken and make them kind of beautiful again. I just love it. It's a good. It's, it's a good cool, right? Yeah, yeah it's, it's a cool. really good. Like if you let it sit in, read the description online. Um, so when you were doing this, did you when you got in the studio for this record, did you know at the time that Chris was leaving, or did that something hap did that happen after? We knew about a month into recording. Okay. So we had started working with Rich. Costi, uh, who produced this record, mm -hmm. and about a month in, he was kind of like, hey guys, I think this has been my last record. And, uh, you know, it was determined that it would be good for him to kind of finish out the record uh, and then kind of leave when, the, when, when we were all done. Did, it, did you feel, I mean, now looking back, did it change the dynamic of the recording after he made that announcement? Well, I think in some ways it made it easier because I think um, when somebody is kind of leaving after a project is done, there's, you, don't, you can be a little more blunt mm -hmm. with them than you would normally be if you had to be, if you knew like, okay, we're gonna take these songs on tour, we're gonna be playing them for a year and a half or whatever. You know, um, not that any of us were nasty about anything. You're not gonna be here, <laughs> so shut up. <laughs> but it does, you know, definitely, we didn't take it that far, but it definitely makes it, you know, it makes it a lot easier to kind of just have very direct conversations. So in some ways, right. uh, it made the process in a way, almost a little bit easier than if it was uh, than we, if we were about to go off on just the road again. Cut through the BS. Yeah, yeah, just cut through. It's the last time we're doing this. Let's you know, let's get it right. You and know? you guys have been together for such a long time that you know, I'm sure it wasn't a huge shock. Uh, I mean, you know, that's the way relationships go, and bands are certainly the most torrid of all relationships because you're a working slash love relationship all the time. Mm -hmm. um, so I just think it's a uh, you know, at some point. You know, that's why people break up. That's what happens. And bands happen, same thing. Yeah, so. you know, I mean, we, you know, obviously we, we you know, are, feel very fortunate for the years that we had with Chris. And he did some great work with mm -hmm. us. And, you know, he'll continue to go off and do great work. And I hope we'll do the same. Now, you brought in Rich Costi, who's worked with, um, you know, Muse. He did the Absolution record. I mean, he's worked with a giant array of um, artists. Why did you kind of go on the outside this time? Well, I think we realized when we tried to make this record as a four piece um, that it just something just wasn't kind of working this time. Mm -hmm. And I think we realized we kind of hit our wall and that we needed to bring somebody else in to kind of uh, freshen up uh, not only the sound, but just kind of pull us in some directions that we maybe were hitherto kind of a little bit scared of. I want to ask, um, I played today, I played uh, Ghost of Beverly Drive on the air. And it sounded great. And I get this, I don't want to say love-hate, but maybe a like-not-like -like relationship with Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. Is that, would that be accurate to say you have that feeling? Uh, yeah, I have, I, have a, I have a complicated relationship with Los Angeles. <laughs> it's complicated on the dating profile. With, <laughs> it's complicated. With Los Angeles. Yeah, <laughs> feelings about Los Angeles, complicated. Yeah. I mean, I, felt, I feel like there's a lot, I mean, just because Beverly Drive, I mean, there could be a Beverly Drive everywhere, but I felt like possibly because we're here in Los Angeles. Is it L.A. heavy? Is your influence L.A. heavy on this record? Well, you know, despite my complicated feelings about Los Angeles, <laughs> I do, you know, I do find it to be a really inspiring place because it's a, it's a city and of, of many kind of flagrant contradictions mm -hmm. just in front of your face all the time. And, you know, I have some friends who love it for those reasons that, you know, you have these 
disparate kind of si ends of a particular spectrum just living side by side at all times here. Mm -hmm. But for me, I think in my life and how I'm in my constant, you know, kind of quest for like, you know, a singular truth, <laughs> kind of sometimes, uh, you know, that kind of dynamic and duality does not really work well for me in my daily life. But I do find it really fascinating creatively. And, you know, they're, they're, it's the reason that so many, you know, wonderful records have been written about Los Angeles and scripts and books and everything else. It's a really very complicated uh, and, you know, uh, interesting place to, to be. There's no singular truth in Los Angeles, so it's a good thing. Well, I think there's no singular truth anywhere, but I'm still kind of looking for <laughs> it. But it's for even it. more so less here in Los <laughs> Angeles. Um, you wrote, you know, I, I, I'm a writer, and I, I heard the song, um, I, I haven't remembered all the titles yet, You've Haunted Me All My Life. Yeah. And uh, there's a line in there that says, uh, there's a fly in my heart's design. Something, something, making mine. What is it? Uh, there's a flaw in my heart's design. And what's the following line? Uh, flaw in my heart's design. And I keep trying to make you mine. Yes, and yeah. I was like, that just like hit me over the head. I like moments like that as a writer. I think are just exceptional when you can really kind of hone in on something. Do you know as a writer when you're when you when you've written like the great line when you've caught it? Are you like yes, beers <laughs> for everybody? You know, I, I, I think, I feel like I'm the most successful when I can see the songs very clearly mm -hmm. in my mind. And that as I'm writing them, it's as if I'm kind of, you know, I'm watching the story kind of unfold in my own mind and just kind of transcribing what I see. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, you know, writing songs is a little bit like just kind of, you know, it's just kind of, you're fumbling in the dark. You're kind of trying to like wait for inspiration and kind of, kind of seem like be beamed from somewhere else. But there are other times when you know a song just seems to kind of almost be transported to you from somewhere else, and it's as if, and as if you're a passive observer and participant in the writing of it. And then you're like, "Yep, done. And next, like, next one." I'm leaving work early today. All right, that sounds yep. good. I like it. I always wonder, you know, you play a lot of big shows, and so sometimes it's, you know, that separation of you, can, you know, now seeing the audience, you know, with the lights being bright uh, or just being so far away. But there has to be moments where I would think you can see the audience and if they're singing the songs back to you, and do you ever, do you ever notice when you're singing that if they're singing the wrong lyrics? <laughs> and does... <laughs> uh, I, I, I do what I, my favorite thing is when we are, we're playing a song that is brand new. Mm -hmm. Like we played a couple shows in January with the new lineup and we debuted a couple songs there. And uh, definitely in Seattle, m m for a, lot of, a lot of people in, in Brooklyn had never heard the songs before. But by the th second or third chorus, you can see them kind of like, like they're trying to sing what they remember. It's like they remember hearing it the first time, and now it's coming back again, and they're trying to remember what the lyrics are in real time. That's kind of adorable. Oh, that's yeah. so cute. You do have really cute fans. You guys kind of fall in that category where... We're a band with cute fans? You're a band with cute fans. I mean, you just always can depend on Death Cab for Cutie to show it up. I mean, I think that's kind of how everybody that's a fan knows, like, all right. New record, great. Now I know what I'm listening to for the next, you know, however months. I certainly hope so. Yeah. What, um, what's your favorite new song to play live? I mean, you just started doing this, or what's the one you're most excited to play live? Uh, There's some great guitar sounds on this record. Yeah, Rich just killed it. Red, yeah. Rich Costi was, I think, basically the reason the guitar sound is as great as I do. Certainly not because of how I play them. <laughs> Uh, I mean, Chris is a much better guitar player than I am, and he can get his own sound sounding awesome. But mm -hmm. any of the kind of leady stuff that I'm doing, it's all because Rich made it sound good. Um, I think probably uh, right now I'm really enjoying playing um, El Dorado, just because it's kind of a newer song that we've just been kind of working out. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we have been having to teach or have the new guys learn all the songs. And in and, and doing that, we're almost kind of getting to experience them again, kind of in a fresh kind of state, which is kind of nice. Nice. So you're playing the Hollywood Bowl um, here in July, I think that date is. Mm -hmm. um, you've played there before. I mean, I played there once. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and you know, you're at this point where you've gotten to play like all of those venues that you probably heard of growing up, like Red Rock, and you know, all those insane venues. I mean, what is it like to look back over? all of these years. I mean, it's been 17 years you've been doing Death Cab for Cutie. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, what would you say to Ben Gibbard back then? You were a solo artist. 
Uh, I don't know. This this journey has been just so uh, weird, and <laughs> and uh, um, with so many twists and turns that you know none of us could have really foreseen. And I think if I were to go back and talk to myself, the 1997 version of myself, I think what I would have told that person to kind of be a little less uptight about things and just let them happen. I think, I think early on we were a fairly uptight bunch, and I think it kind of hindered our ability to kind of enjoy some of the weirder, or I should say, I'll just put it on myself, it, it hindered me to, to, to enjoying some of the weirder parts of this experience. I, I feel like that. just, I, I'm playing catch up now. I'm trying to be a lot more like laissez-faire about things now. But it's, it's weird, you know. It's, but it's I can strange. tell that. I mean, I've talked to you a few times, and yeah. whether it's because we, you know, we know each other a little bit better each time, maybe it's that, or because you are relaxing and enjoying it more. Um, that has totally. to add a whole new element of awesome to to what you're doing. Well, and this, you know, I feel like the stakes also change with every record we put out. You know, mm -hmm. at a certain point, I remember the first time we came here, I was really kind of freaked out that like, we're at K Rock. This is like a big deal. We had to do because well. everybody, all of these, you know, haunt shows that are out here are telling you, <laughs> like, oh, you gotta, you gotta do this. You gotta be good. Like, to mention the record, mention the single. You know, so you're getting pumped up with all. Well, of that. and you know, yeah, and it was just kind of a new world. I mean, when we signed to Atlantic, and we, you know, all of a sudden we're coming to places like K Rock, it was. It was a virtually new experience. I mean, you know, for all of us, and and you know, this we, I think we were kind of all very aware of what the potential stakes of, of things were at that point, and it was a real kind of, you know, uh, fork in the road for us. We were, it was either going to go one of two ways, you know. And thankfully for us, you know, signing to Atlantic and kind of, you know, taking the road that we took turned out to be, I think, the right one. And so now when we come back, it's like I I like to see you and catch up and stuff like that. And it, it doesn't feel strange being here, and it feels like I'm kind of like, oh, going back to K Rock, cool. <laughs> See, cats can be great. You're home away from home. Yeah. Uh, yeah, actually, I actually took out a locker out in the hallways. You had a locker. Did you really? Yeah, I put my name on it. So oh, that's awesome. Put a, put a lock on it. Gonna be a fight over it later. Over there, yeah. Someone's gonna be very upset. Who took my locker? Who's this Ben <laughs> Gibbard? Um, so you're going all over the world, and you're gonna do all of this stuff, and you know you're playing. Do you feel like? Do you feel like there's gonna be this weird dynamic on the stage, without Walla this time around? We're just getting used to kind of learning curve. You know, uh, I, not really, actually. I mean, you know, um, I think that what we're kind of what we've brought in to the band are two uh, gentlemen who are really enthusiastic and excited to be there, mm -hmm. and I think that um, you know they they very much want to be here and be a part of this, and I think that that energy is really infectious, and being able to kind of have, you know, to feel like you know, we are complete as an entity and that everybody is excited about the experience is something that we, it's, we haven't really had uh, for a while. So I think like, you know, when everybody wants to be there, it just makes a much more kind of celebratory kind of atmosphere. Right. Um, and you know, uh, and you know, Chris, I think for a lot of time wanted to be in the studio, wanted to be making records and, you know, touring is, is even touring at the level that we're doing now is, it's a weird, strange, Life and it's it's not like working in a coal mine, but it, you know it has its elements <laughs> that are kind of difficult, you know. So it's kind of like we just you know you have to kind of roll with it, and you have to right. be kind of cut from a cloth that you know you have to be built for it, and, and right. some people aren't. And to enjoy it, so that everybody yeah. enjoys it. Now we were just talking. We you guys didn't see this. We were talking about um, some like metal and stuff off air. Um, is there like you know your fans expect you to be in this certain little box? of type of music. Do you have in you like a kind of music that doesn't seem uh, like a creation that you feel like you could make this record under an assumed name? I mean, I'm not talking like Garth okay. Brooks, Christopher Gaines kind of thing. Right. I'm talking about like something that just seems so out of the zone of Death Cab for Cutie, a postal service or any of that. You know, the thing that I'm the most inhibited by is the fact that I had this little wimpy voice that makes kind of doing anything tough kind of difficult. <laughs> like it makes it makes like doing an ACDC cover night impossible. I would kill to see that. Does yeah. Kitty does ACDC? There was a time. I mean, we even like we. There was a time we were trying to put together a Creedence uh, Creedence cover band, and like the hardest person to find was a singer. Just finding somebody who can sing, like uh, John Fogarty, John Fogarty yeah. is like is the hardest part of it, really. So, I mean, and I was, we were trying to like, we were trying to track something, I can't remember what it was, and it was just like, yeah, you know, I just can't do this. I can maybe sing Lodi, 
You know, something that's kind of a little more like ballad I can maybe do that, but I mean. Well, maybe you need to just, maybe look at the girls. Maybe you'd be like the share cover band or something. Oh, yeah. Because your voice is, if you, if yeah, you yeah. consider your voice, you know, a little bit wimpy, so maybe yeah, you take yeah, on a girl. Okay. okay, that's a good idea. I'm just saying. Yeah, I mean, it's probably, it'd be more appropriate probably than trying to do like a, like, you know, Metallica. Well, if you do it, happen. sign me up. I'm in. Okay. I'm good with that. Okay, cool. Um, one last question before we let you go, because you have a lot of stuff on your plate with this whole new record and, uh, you know, promoting it. Um, I saw you on some of the uh, Sonic Highways stuff that you, um, I always think of you because, you know, you, you're just really nice and mild-mannered and easy to talk to, but then I see you in the studio with Dave Grohl, who just seems so big and bombastic and, how is that energy when you were in the studio? You were, you know, rec you were singing on uh, Subterranean on that track, mm -hmm. um, you know, and you're taking direction from him. So how how did how did that dynamic work? Yeah, I mean, you know, I've I've kind of spent a little bit of time with Dave. Not not enough that we got to like downtime where we got to get like really deep about stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty fun and atmosphere in the studio with those guys. And what was really kind of great to experience was how much those guys just really get off on each other's humor and it's like it's clear that they are enjoying being a huge rock band in the exact right way. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like they're yeah. kind of older guys now for rock and roll they have you know a lot of them have families they just but they love hanging out with each other love playing music and you can just see how they interact that they truly truly love this you know and Dave's energy is just like he's up he was up the whole time. Like he must just be mainlining like espresso. I don't know what that guy's deal is, but I mean, <laughs> he, he was, gave up coffee. But, but I don't he's know. like, I mean, he's really up there. And yeah. so you know, you just kind of got to, you just kind of like, just got to take the ride. It's like Space Mountain. You just got to get in, and just kind of like give yourself over to the fact that you'll stay on the tracks for the most part. Well, and probably for someone like you that said, you know, it took you a while to kind of relax and enjoy the ride. That must have also kind of been a a nice instance to be like, yes, this is what you do. It this was so is what fun, we're doing, totally. You know? And you know, also those. I mean, any band has all their own inside jokes, and right. like they have all their own, their own humor, and they. So it's like they vacation together, whatever they do. So it's like you know, these guys have been together longer than we have. Right. So they have another what, almost ten years, five or six years of you know, kind of like you know, inside jokes and and kind of humor and, and relating to each other. So it's kind of like you're around all of them. And you're kind of just like, yeah, me too, guys, right? Yeah, jokes. <laughs> you kind of have to just kind of just like let them be themselves and kind of like, yeah, I got a funny thing to add to that. Yeah. Well, you have a good, your band's really, really nice. It's always been fun guys in the band and Nick and Jason and just like a good time. So um, you're number not too one shabby party, yourself. Yeah, we're the number one party band in the I think that should be the your Northwest, tour t-shirt. Right, yeah. Death Cat for Cutie, number one Number party one party band. band in the Northwest. <laughs> Well, thank you um, for stopping by, and congratulations on Kintsugi. Uh, eighth studio album, that's not too bad. Not too bad, Ben Gibbard. Well, thank you. Well, it's nice to see you again, and thanks for having it's me. It's lovely. Thank you for coming by. Bye, everybody.